the, for me, the context of this is a lot to do with um, Ken Livingston, uh, the Ford report, um, what's happened with uh, Margaret Hodge. I mean, Ken Livingston was at the, at the fire, in the firing line on anti-Semitism allegations from, from almost the beginning um, and was obviously an ally of Jeremy Corbyn's. To hear that he's not doing well and is in debt um, shows how much damage that has done. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Jackie Walker, because um, obviously Jackie Walker was another person who was uh, in the firing line for this. Jackie, um, what do you think of the the Margaret Hodge? Uh, I'd like to talk about the Margaret Hodge tweet that I, I put up there. I'll just show it again. Um, within her tweet, she says, I'm fed up of CAA using anti-Semitism as a front to attack Labour. So she's saying that effectively that anti-Semitism is being um, weaponized, which I believe is something that you're not supposed to say and has led to people getting into trouble. What do you think of, of what she said about, I don't know what the CAA is, and do you I, think that I, she will get away with this? I think you should know what and who the CAA are because they are a supposed charity. I say a supposed charity, but actually, if you look behind them, what they are is a, an Israeli lobby front. And they don't disclose actually who their directors and their patrons are anymore. They stopped doing that in 2020. But the people who used to be their sponsors and supporters were people who were like paying money to the IDF, the Israeli army, paying money to the settlement system. That's who they are. They are, in my opinion, vicious, the most vicious, nasty and unpleasant of the groups that are linked and in this web of unpleasant, nasty intrigue. In fact, some of you may remember that um, I think it's the uh, director, John Glassman, after Corbyn lost the election, did that kind of macabre, very vampiric sort of um, video when he talked about slaughtering um, uh, Corbyn and he thanked, or he made a long list of people to thank, in, including his spies and his intel. But the thing about our Margaret is that she was one of these patrons. So to come up now with this idea that she doesn't know who they are or what they support is amazing. So you might think, why are they doing this? Why is she doing this? Well, you've got to think, first of all, Margaret Hodge on social media acts as a troll. She will say this thing. You can see it. She kind of takes delight in saying the most terrible things and then getting the left to respond. And the second thing, of course, is most people out there, they don't follow it like we do. So they just take her as read. This is the woman, by the way, who submitted 200 complaints against the Labour Party members for anti-Semitism. And I think all but something like 80 of them were not actually, even to begin with, Labour Party members, and very few of them actually had actually said anything in particular. So this is a very unpleasant bunch of people. Yeah, um, and, and you, you, obviously you don't think that she'll be given any grief by the party? I think she'll be made a baroness very soon, because I, I'm sorry, Ken, but I think your support of, of Starmer is crazy. It is totally, utterly crazy. This is a man who has gone out of his way to smash the left. This is, this is something that it, it's so obviously true that, that they've done that. And he's, she's going to have all her involvement in, 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 in the kind of sex abuse, children's sex abuse scandal. Nobody mentions that. Nobody mentions the stuff about her family and taxes because she is now untouchable. The mass, the mainstream media won't touch her at all. And she'll be in, in his, in his honours list, I'm sure. She will be, I don't know, Baroness Margaret of Trumpton or something or another. Right. Um, look, I'm, going, I'm going to bring in uh, Chris 
Williamson as as well, who's obviously uh, been in the firing line uh, for this uh, anti-Semitism. Chris, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, what, what's your What's your take on on the Margaret Hodge thing? I mean, that's just it's so uh, inconsistent that that they weren't already if they should have already uh, suspended her for that, shouldn't they? <laughs> Well, it's the height of hypocrisy. I mean, I said something very similar to what she said and found myself in the firing line from the likes of Margaret Hodge and Ruth Smith and, and the rest of the, the Zionist trolls. I mean, you know, the truth is, this is the sort of thing that, that Jeremy and the Socialist Campaign Group should have been saying uh, right from the outset. They gave credence to the bogus complaints. I mean, they facilitated it essentially by continually uh, apologizing and, and giving ground to, to the Zionist lobby. I mean, at the end of the day, look, the, the Zionist lobby, the red state, I mean, they, they employ a kind of maximalist strategy. I mean, it's not just a political strategy. I mean, they want to absolutely crush people. I mean, we've seen what they've done to, to Ken Livingston, what they succeeded in doing and pushing me out of parliament, what they've done to, to Jeremy Corbyn. And indeed, many People thought that, you know, as soon as I was pushed out of Parliament, take my own case, for example, that, uh, you know, that would be the end of the uh, attacks. But, it, you know, they just continued uh, as before. Um, they want to crush any semblance of anti-imperialism, anti-Zionism from the Labour Party. They want to crush any semblance of, of, of socialism. And uh, the hypocrisy doesn't surprise me. Well, what, um, can, I do, can I just come in? Because uh, just, I'm just yeah. thinking, well, why do you think they have uh, the CAA campaign against anti-Semitism. Why do you think they've attacked Starmer? Do, do you think uh, that, I mean, he's he's been saying all the right things really, hasn't he? He's just made a, a mistake. It was someone in his office didn't think about it or something like that, obviously. Do you think there's something behind that? Do you think they're fed up with Starmer? Do you think there's a, 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 well, maybe. an agenda there? Maybe, but as I've said, you know, the Zionists, they play a kind of a maximalist strategy. Um, and seemingly, you know, Starmer you know, isn't, isn't, isn't sort of uh, satisfactory for them any longer. Can I What do you want to say, Jackie? Can I actually add something to that? Because a lot, a, a big point that some people have missed is that, that a few hours after this story actually blew, it was very interesting. The Jewish News let out this article, a kind of, let's be nice to Starmer because he didn't mean it, just like you're saying. Actually, I just think he didn't bother thinking about it. It was the kind of thing that Corbyn would have been slaughtered about, of course, but that's another thing. But what that article added to the story was that Starmer then said that the CAA will be at the heart of any Labour, future Labour government. Now, Chris is right, because what you do, particularly this is what the Zionists do. You don't stop putting pressure on. It's worked. So you keep putting pressure on and you get more. They're not bothered about whether it's Starmer or whoever. They just want to stay in the centre. So they've now squeezed out that pledge from him that the CAA will be at the heart of anything to do with this subject. That's what this is about. I see. So that, that it, it's, um, it's about... It's about sort of playing hard, hard uh, ball, or whatever, really? and and and, the, well, and a lot of the people. It's already been subjected to state capture in terms of its disciplinary processes mm. and its uh, and its policy making structures. Uh, I mean, that's just a matter of fact. If you actually look at it, um, I mean, they've even got an ex-Israeli spy working at the very heart of the Labour Party's operation now. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of brazen about it. Uh, you know, if anybody's looking to the Labour Party to offer any semblance of a, of a kind of a left-wing agenda or, or an anti-imperialist agenda, then, you know, they're barking up the wrong tree. There is no chance whatsoever. The Labour Party's gone. People need to get used to that. And we need to find an alternative and build an alternative. You're wasting your time <laughs> focusing on trying to regain some sort of control over the Labour Party. It's impossible to achieve. We nearly got there with Jeremy. We didn't achieve it. And the reason we didn't achieve it was because the left were pathetic, or certain sections of the left were pathetic. They didn't support the grassroots. They didn't support the democracy agenda. They didn't 
didn't stand up to the Zionist lobby. They didn't stand up sufficiently to the right wing of the Labour Party and the military yeah. industrial complex and all these other characters that were that were attacking us. But the key thing that killed us was the anti-Semitism agenda. And that was the Zionist lobby. And that was used as a convenient stick to beat Jeremy and his supporters with. And the mistake was right. the... Uh, you know, on behalf of the uh, of the kind of you know the trendy lefties um, in Navarra media and uh, as I say, I mean, in the yeah. socialist campaign group and in and in the leaders' office, there was no resistance to it. They just backed off all the time. And there was a white flag flying over the Lotto's office. There was there was no red flag. Um, and you're just never going to succeed when all you do is appease your your, your enemies. We, I right, mean, that, like, come yeah. in and he's demonstrated a bit of kind oh, of steel yeah, in that, that sense. And this, you know, Jeremy should have been about an ounce of, of that ruthlessness, that ruthless streak that we see Starmer deploying. Then Jeremy would have been in Downing Street and we'd have been transforming the country. But the yeah, trying no, no, to appease people but, like that was the absolute catastrophic error. So I'm trying to come in because there's so many people need to come on. I want to move on to the uh, Labour leaks, uh, which I'll, I'll be bringing you back on later to talk about that. I just wanted to talk about the Margaret Hodge issue uh, on its own, really, because I think, in a, in a sense, Labour leaks overshadowed that, and I don't want that to be lost um, uh, as a as a separate issue. So I wanted to start with that, um, and I and there's loads to talk about Labour leaks. I'm, I'm, it's a very ambitious uh, show. I know it's ridiculous, but. Um, I, I want to get as many people to speak. That, Chris, you'll, Chris and Jackie, obviously, I, I will speak to you about the Labour leaks a bit later. Thank you for, thank you for now. Uh, now I'm going to move on to Labour leaks. I say the first person I'd like to speak to about Labour leaks is Steve Walker, who has been doing a lot of work on this um, since since the report, the leaked report. Uh, came out in 2020 which revealed shockingly from probably the biggest shock of the whole thing was the fact that there was money being taken out of the siphoned out of the party for a separate campaign that wasn't for jeremy corbyn but for people that um in the uh south side supported steve has the fraud report addressed the fact that there was saboteurs taking money out of Labour's uh, accounts, the membership's money, in order to um, sponsor their own separate campaign, effectively? Uh, well, yes and no. And let me apologise, because it looks as though my video is lagging a bit behind my sound, at least for me. Um, but uh, yes and no. So yes, they've addressed the fact of the what they call the Ergon House Project, which was the cover name they had for um, this money that they were siphoning off for their own purposes. Uh, no, they haven't called them saboteurs. So the, this was, you know, the, the the Ford report hasn't been as bad of a whitewash as I feared it might be. But, uh, you know, one of the areas where it's definitely uh, soft soap and everything is in this refusal to say that the uh, Labour rate were deliberately undermining um, the, uh, you know, the, the general election campaign and Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And I think there's, there's you know, it does admit though that the uh, Labour rate was doing what it did to try to, uh, well, as it saw, you know, or it describes it, um, protect the party from Jeremy Corbyn. Well, you know, I mean, that's the, the whole tone of the report really is, is off in the sense that it both sides uh, pretty much every issue and talks about, you know, Corbyn's attempts to run the party as if they're on a par with the uh, rights attempts to stop him running the party when in fact he had a massive democratic mandate. Um, but yeah, they do. They do address Ergon, uh, Ergon House or GE Nine, I think it was something like that. They called it as, as their secret uh, expense code for where they were putting this money, and it was, you know, a very significant amount of money. But the Ford report then crucially ignores other stuff, you know, and it's finding that it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't deliberate sabotage. They ignore stuff like the fact that the uh, the right wing staff were actually faking Facebook ads to fool Jeremy Corbyn and his office into thinking that there were, you know, things would be an advertisement, in fact, they were doing their own thing. So there were, you know, and that, that came out, I mean, I brought that years ago, but it came out eventually in the so-called mainstream press. Um, you know, these things don't happen by accident. And when you put that together with the absolute devastation of the Labour right, 
that the result went well uh, for Jeremy Corbyn on the 8th of June 2017, um, you know, it's obvious that they did not want the party to succeed. And, uh, you know, I think there's ample evidence that it was deliberate sabotage and not uh, some kind of accidental consequence of a disagreement over policies and ideology. Well, I mean, there's uh, I saw a, a, a tweet from Len McCluskey uh, in which he sort of addresses it as as the Ford report has enough evidence within it to show that that money wasn't being used right, and that there should be some kind of um, discipline or something, some report, some further inquiry into that. It, it, do you get the feeling that the Ford report's got enough in it to nail some? uh dishonesty and, and and illegality in some way i think there's ample evidence in there the problem is that whether whether this is his original conclusion or the result of two years of haggling with the uh with the party leadership in terms of it you know being delayed from when it was supposed to be uh, released in summer 2020 um i i don't know but it does read as though there are various bits of the report that have been kind of tweaked or inserted in order to Give the uh, the party some of its uh, you know something to work with and its sound bites it needs to for its its spin. Uh, you know whether that's the case or not, I, I'm not in a position to say. But it, you know, to me, it reads that way. Um, but I think that uh, you know there there is ample evidence to say it was sabotage, and there is ample evidence to say it was entirely deliberate, and there is ample evidence to say that the Labour right wing staffers were grossly racist, misogynistic, and uh, essentially you know usurped. Jeremy Corbyn's mandate, because, you know, that's the, the Ford report seems to take this thing of all oh, the party staff is supposed to be like a civil service as being the justification for the way they were behaving. But the civil service's job is to implement the policies of the people who are elected. It's not to obstruct and undermine the policies of the people who are elected. And, yeah. uh, and that's obviously what they did uh, and how you can then have those, you know, all of that listed in the report. And then conclude that it wasn't sabotage is, is beyond me. But you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm not a QC. Uh, but you know, it it seems to be uh, entirely obvious that the Labour right was desperate for the party to fail, because they saw that as their quickest route for getting ready to you know, get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and uh, you know, that's uh, that's all entirely in line with the evidence. Um, right. Okay. Well, I'm going to move. Justice system. Sometimes the evidence doesn't seem to have any bearing on the verdict. But there you go. Well, I'm, go I'm going to move on. Ben, ben Timberley's done a few screenshots and stuff from the, the report. To, and uh, uh, he's, he's, he's great at this stuff. He's, he's good at screenshots. I know you are um, as well, Steve. I've seen your screenshots. They're pretty good. Um, but we'll get back to you. We'll talk about something later on. I'm just going to try and get as many things in as I can to cram them into this short time. Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, so, uh, Ben Timberley, uh, you've been tweeting about how many tweets was it 70 you did yesterday or something yeah it was it was around that i've um i've added more to the thread today i'm only halfway through the report going through it line by line um and providing feedback on every single thing i see one of the things i always recommend to people to do when you read a report like this is don't just go straight to the results or the conclusions go through the body of the text and analyze what is actually found versus what their opinions are because often you can find the nuggets and the differences in between those two things and boy have we found quite a lot okay look you're going to be on for you're going to do a few sections here um and we're going to come in with people to speak in between so it, it uh, i'm going to leave you to, to get on with it because I'm, I'm already running <laughs> no worries so in terms of the first section um if many of you remember a while ago we did a report on labor together um, an, an external organization to the Labour Party, a private organization with private funders, um, you know, hedge funds, uh, people associated with Bicom, etc. Um, the Ford report references the report that was put out about the elections and the election losses by Labour together. That report was co-authored with an organisation called Valent Projects. Valent Projects have been highlighted um, by the Grey Zone and other organisations as essentially a spy for hire, a spook company that um, has essentially um, been subcontracted by the Labour Party to produce videos, social media output, oh, and of course, spying um, on their behalf. So uh, Valent Projects have been working with Labour together um, you know, in various different ways, and this a report references them in a positive way talking about their report that was put together and uh, my belief is that the the forward inquiry were unaware 
of the relationship um, between Valent Projects and Labour Together and the work that they were doing you know, on behalf of the right wing um, featured in the actual Ford inquiry itself. So it seems like there's a circular issue there and the naivety and um, lack of knowledge that um, actually put it the Ford report has that has been highlighted in that issue secondly um I think and this has been highlighted already so far there's false equivalence happening all the way through the Ford um report unfortunately we're seeing the democratic mandate of the Corbyn uh, lotto as it's referred to in the report uh, versus the HQ of Southside being put on the same level it, it, it just can't be done you know the uh, there is no dem democratic mandate for civil service staff you know, labor civil service staff to make decisions to come up with policy on the hoof to come up with strategic direction and implement their thoughts and political feelings over and beyond the leadership of the party democratically elected by millions of labor party members that is what happened and they subverted that they put their interests first it is completely wrong it is completely indefensible and for the Ford report to put them on an equal footing um, it's a bit like saying oh um, you know um, the husband is hitting his wife uh, and therefore the wife needs to apologize for the bruises on the husband's hand it, it, it just it's indefensible and I think the, the Ford report has, has got a real problem there that being said um, I have to admit that the Ford report has done a good job in terms of presenting a fairly complete record of qu uh, quite a few of the issues that happened. There's, there's lots of new stuff in here. Um, and I think the deep dive that they've done into uh, you know, the various issues around it, the information and uh, most of all the records that were available to them, you know, I've, I've got to say well done to them for that. Um, what is interesting is that they did abandon the second part of their investigation almost entirely because they couldn't get cooperation from key people. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn amongst them now the reason Jeremy Corbyn didn't participate was because he has ongoing court cases that could have been um, influenced unfairly and unfortunately if he had contributed to this report so if anybody says that he didn't contribute that's why because he's got ongoing legal action that would be influenced uh, unduly if he had uh, contributed to this and finally um, I, I think then this is one of the things that really bugs me you know it was great to have Steve on earlier you know his reporting about the uh, the, <laughs> the bounce back email address uh, that came out and um, re revealing the involvement of a spin doctor agency called Haslam Dodd uh, that is essentially a Blairite, Campbell-esque, Mandelson-friendly um, spin doctor agency, um, communications ag agency as they call themselves. They appeared to be receiving emails directly from the submission email address to the Ford inquiry. So it basically meant that any evidence or information that was submitted to the inquiry appears to have been forwarded directly onto Sherry Dodd, her personal email address. You know, this was um, you know, gleaned from a technical malfunction on that email address that was first reported by Squawk Box. Fantastic break in the story. Well done, Steve. Now, unfortunately, that hasn't been answered in terms of the inquiry, in terms of what's been going on. There has been no mention of it at all. And the really concerning part of it is this. I have seen many of the submissions to the Ford inquiry and the scope of those submissions goes way beyond the scope of the inquiry itself, which means there's all kinds of information that has been dumped into this inquiry. There's either sitting in email inboxes, sitting on shelves, sitting in you know, storage document folders that isn't relevant to the scope of the inquiry, but was absolutely explosive. Now, imagine you're a paid spin doctor agency and your job is to fix things for very bad people. And you've been given an insight into all the things they've done, what's been put out there into the public domain and what people know. You are then able to cover it up, to clear it away, to fix it for those people. And you know, there is the potential for this huge amount of information to work against the natural justice that many of these people were seeking when they submitted to the Ford inquiry. So there's a real problem there and still big questions to be answered by the Ford report and the Ford inquiry. Um, Beyond that, um, I suggest keeping an eye on the mammoth thread that I've started on Twitter about the Ford report. Um, it's, it's, it's at the moment it's being used to uh, rebut various journalists in the mainstream media. Um, please do carry on doing that. I'm hoping that the information that's presented in there will be useful to you and hopefully counter the narrative from some of these mainstream media right wing hacks. Um, it, it's, it's tough going. I've been doing this since yesterday morning and I'm probably going to be doing this until close of play tomorrow if I can maintain the stamina. That's all for now. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, now, I'm going to move on to uh, Leah Levain, who's um, from Jewish Voice for Labour. Um, Leah, can you hear me? 
I, I can't. Oh, I can yes, hear you now. I can unmute now. <laughs> now, um, within within the report that that it says that Jewish Voice for Labour um, should play a part in anti-Semitism training, or or should have been a part of anti-Semitism training. Can you tell us about that? Um, and also, I, I I've got a screenshot of of a group that weren't happy about <laughs> what Voice for... a couple of groups that weren't happy about that. Could you can you tell can you tell us um, sure. what the report so, says about Jewish Voice for Labour? So the the key thing that it says, it, well, it has a very detailed criticism of the so-called education that is offered by the Jewish Labour movement. It acknowledges and appreciates them, but it actually says it's not the way to do it. It's didactic, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the way to actually. Um, educate people about anti-Semitism and any other, and as and other things is education and time for reflection and so on. Um, so, and they feel disappointed that uh, um, Jewish Voice for Labour were, were not approached, you know, with our expertise um, and our education and, and specifically that CLPs were forbidden from, uh, from uh, approaching us um, once uh, Starm had come in. So some of the criticisms uh, post date the, uh, the the leak report so so on, on that but so you it, that that was written in the report and then this mm. uh statement came out um from the mm. board of deputies of british jews uh which says um we are troubled by the author's later expression that they are disappointed um that jewish voice for labor an extreme fringe far left organization that has obsessively denied anti-Semitism within the Labour Party has not been granted a role in educating yeah, yeah. Labour members on anti-Semitism. The authors of this report need to clarify this position. That, that well, the reality, that reality Crispin, Crispin, the reality is that the authors of the report clarified their position. They just that the Board of Deputies don't agree with their position, and that's their right. But what isn't their right is to continually call us things like sham Jewish organizations, obsessively anti-Semitism denying. And I'm a bit concerned, and Ben might pick this up, about the sort of credit given to the levels of denialism, as if that's some sort of equivalence. Um, so that's a whole other issue. But JVL has never denied anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, let alone obsessively so. Um, and the approach that we've taken before we were stopped, and we still do it to, to other groups, um, and, but we can't officially do it for any CLPs or, or any Labour Party bodies, is precisely about education uh, and time for reflection and not about telling people this is the line. It's about getting people to think for themselves um, and consider. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, it, it, it is shocking, and I've just been sent, and I could put it in the chat a, um, um, in a minute, um, an article in Jewish News by um, Adam Langleben, and Jackie may have things to say about him, who I think is the National Secretary of the Jewish Labour Movement, which is, I mean, I've literally just read it um, as a, a, a seconds before this started, so I haven't quite thought, but it, it is a travesty what he says, and that's published. And we have approached me to, we, we have approached um, Jewish News and Times of Israel, but they haven't taken up. We wrote, we wrote to the, with a very succinct comment to the Jewish uh, Chronicle, but they have chosen, ha ha ha, surprise, surprise, not to pick up our, our, our points. Um, so, I mean, I have other things to say about the report, but I think that they will be covered by other people and particularly by Ben right. with his forensic stuff. But, um, can I just say, I mean, the, there's a big missing, uh, which is how this is, you know, what, what happened in the, the so-called factionalism of Lotto. Um, and, you know, um, it doesn't take account of the concerted campaign, not just by the headquarters and the Parliamentary Labour Party, but by the mainstream media. And I do think that um, in in him bending for bending over so far backwards to us to to try and create a sense of balance it's allowed uh the right-wing media and other people who are not friends of ours to pick and choose the bits and imply that this the anti-semitism was used as a weapon by both sides um there's more to say and i i need to do more thinking about this how come this denialism 
and still saying that there, these, you know, there was nothing to suggest that you know, levels of anti-Semitism weren't, weren't serious, when actually there's masses, if you look back at the um, um, Bad News for Labour uh, report, you know, they, that, that at worst, 0.1% of the, of the membership were accused of anti-Semitism at worst. So even if they're all guilty, you know, it is worth pointing those things out. And at no point was this not taken seriously. And another point, and I know you've got other views, so I will stop. I've got, yeah. This. Yeah, okay. literally my last point. It failed, you know, there were lots of good things in it. As, as Ben said, when you dig down, sometimes after under their own headlines, it's very clear. A lot of it is very much on our side. But it's um, it, 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 a big missing. It, it, it's an implication that the left didn't take anti-Semitism seriously. Corbyn commissioned the Royal Report and the Chakrabarti Report, and they reported within nine months of him being elected leader. That's how seriously he took the allegations of anti-Semitism. And we've discussed before what happened um, right. with those reports. But to imply, even just by not say, stating it, that, uh, that it wasn't quite taken seriously enough when that happened. Anyway, I know you've got lots of other people. I right. that no, that's that's true. I've got, that's I've got other people to sort of back you up on that. So. Thank you. <laughs> thank, I'll, I'll thank stop. You. I know. Thank you so sure. much. Thank you, Leah. Um, now I'm going to move to uh, Simon McGinn, who's um, been doing a campaign on on Twitter mostly called "It Was a Scam." I'm sure many people have seen the, the hashtag. Uh, Simon, what what do you make of the Ford report, and um, does it does it show that it was a scam, or or does it show that it wasn't a scam? Hi, Christopher. Um, it, it's it's an extraordinary document. I haven't read the whole thing. I can't claim to, but the, the the excerpts that I've seen are just extraordinary. One of the things it says quite explicitly is that the authors of the report saw no evidence that any accusation of anti-Semitism had been fabricated. I think they caveat it by saying within the confines of the report or something. But, but what Ford is saying is that there have been no false accusations of anti-Semitism. Well, we know that's false. Everybody knows that's false. Everybody knows that many of the accusations, most of the crisis accusations, that there was a crisis of anti-Semitism, are completely fabricated. I've listed 10 of them on a blog post. Um, it was a scam has been trending recently as more and more people have found out the level of fraud in the anti-Semitism crisis campaign. Ford attempts to claim that this does not exist. Well, then he is simply denying reality because reality says quite plainly this evidence does exist it is easily accessible it is public and there is no reason on earth why martin ford qc could not have found it he simply didn't find it i find that just astonishing um, and extraordinary it's worth noting in this context that the original labor leaks report itself the 2020 leaked report uh, repeated many of the false accusations of anti-Semitism, many of the crisis allegations. It took them for granted as true. They're not true, they're false. So there are problems actually in the leaked report itself, let alone the report on the leaked report, which then goes on to amplify this completely false idea that there were no false accusations. We know that to be false. The other thing that I find absolutely extraordinary about it is the both sidesing of the debate. What it attempts to say is that both sides used anti-Semitism as a factional weapon. What it doesn't do is explain to anybody how the left were using the fact of being smeared with anti-Semitism against the right. How does that work? It obviously doesn't, does it? It's obviously nonsense. I cannot take this report in any way seriously. I'm sorry, I haven't read it all, but I simply cannot take it seriously because it repeats A, a completely false um, suggestion that there were no false accusations of anti-Semitism, which we know is not true. And B, it tempts to both sides a smearing war, which was conducted by the center and right on the left. It attempts to say that the left were also at fault somehow for being smeared with anti-Semitism by the center and the right. I find that outrageous. If Martin Ford wishes to come on Twitter and debate with me personally, I'm very happy to do so. Um, I will just, in finishing, just say it was a scam, it remains a scam, and no amount of Martin Ford's report changes that in any way, shape, or form. Well, well, I, I think I know where you stand on that then, uh, <laughs> Simon. Thank, thank you. 
spoken. Um, now, uh, I'm going to move. Uh, where, where, we, where are we going now? We're going back to Ben. Um, ben, have you got uh, have you got any any more to to add to to to, to what you've looked at from the so report? The, the only thing I want to show people, um, mainly because it's kind of personal to me, um, is I just want to show this one post that I put together on the Twitter feed, and it'll be the last thing I'll show you all today because. Um, no, my luck, somebody will probably <laughs> cause problems with this, but let's give it a whirl. Um, I'm going to share this on the screen so you can see what it is. Just want to check. Can you all see this? Give me a quick thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Bear with me. Not showing the right thing. There we go. So this is a, a post that I put on the, the epic Twitter thread started yesterday. Um, and I'll, I'll read it out for you so you can all hear it. A £135,000 secret printing budget, question. Worked on by Sam Matthews, question. Who, impl who implemented the system and had a cosy relationship with the supplier, question. Which people stood to gain from siphoning off that £135,000 of campaign funds into this special pot. And here's why I've labelled that. So here you can see an extract from the Ford report, which says some senior HQ staff had the ability to implement resourcing decisions covertly. A handful of staff in Ergon House, that is a special location that they used to house this project, created an additional fund for printing costs under code GEL001, spending one, uh, some £135,000 in total on campaigns supportive of sitting largely anti-Corbyn MPs and not on campaigns for pro-Corbyn candidates in potentially Tory winnable seats. I mean, that by itself is bad enough. Now, if you go to the original leaks document, there's an extract in here that I'll read for you. Both Sam Matthews, Head of Disputes, and Sophie Goodyear, Head of Safeguarding and Complaints, worked on this project, and other key dispute staff such as Ben Westerman and Louise Withers-Green also appear to have been involved in or aware of it. After the election, Matthews asked to be back paid at a higher pay rate, reflecting, although his new role did not have a formal title, his increased responsibilities from the 12th of May to the 8th of June 2017, including direct responsibility for budget management, procurement of services, dealing directly with a range of suppliers and managing more than twice, twice as many staff as normal, with a range of very different skills from the disputes team, such as designers, copywriters, videographers, etc. Sophie Goodyear suggested it might be worth mentioning the level of budget management, but Matthews responded, importantly, I don't want to put the scale of budget in writing. He did note, though, that the party could afford this, and I left 100k in that budget. How nice of him to do so. Now, here's the kicker. Many years ago, uh, when I was being smeared by this chap um, and utterly violated by him in all kinds of ways, I decided to do a little bit of investigating. And since 2016, I've been building a vault of screen grabs, digital documents and all sorts of things. And here's two of them that I kept. So the first one is when Sam Matthews is giving a recommendation to a chap on LinkedIn called Tansel, a digital program director at Every Woman. Um, I think it was a different company that he was working for at the time. Sam is a brilliant person to work with on any project. From the offset, I found that Sam easily understood project requirements and communicated them effectively. Sam is also a very pleasant person and manages to get things done well and on time. I also like how Sam gets straight to the point and is realistic in his estimates, especially on budgets. <laughs> I have thoroughly enjoyed working with Sam and would recommend both his skills and pleasant character as a great addition to any project. Let's get to the fun bit, shall we? Here's the recommendation that Sam gave Tansel. Tansel's commitment and work ethic shone through for the duration of the project. He brought some much needed stability to a project in desperate need of solid management. I know I could trust Tansel to assess exactly what the project needed and make the case for it, even when additional spend was required from our end. Lots of money. It was also prompt in uh, responding, but understood when an issue was important and time critical, often responding to emails of particular importance well outside of normal office hours. I wonder why. <laughs> the print campaign, print campaign, the Labour Party delivered at the 2015 general election would not have been possible were it not for Tansel's project management in building one of the most sophisticated web to print platforms used by any political party in the world. So in short, what this spells out, this post spells out that Sam Matthews had budgetary knowledge, systems knowledge, print knowledge, um, you know, organisational knowledge. And also that he was responsible for managing the entire team of this during the election, 
He was the central guy behind this entire project of Ergon House. He was the chap at the middle of this. And if you received emails from Sam Matthews, like I did, suspending you for all sorts of spurious reasons and leading you a merry dance and ruining your life, this post is absolute vindication that this guy was right at the middle of all of this stuff. And you know what? I'm really happy I posted that. It made me feel a lot better. That's me for now. Uh... Yeah, um, Ben, you're going to get me in a uh, lot of trouble again, aren't you? Um, <laughs> but thank you, thank you for thank you for that one. Um, now I'm going to uh, Jackie Walker's uh, Jackie uh, Jackie Walker's uh, got a, a, has been looking at the report um, and says she's read it all. But she, Jackie, how, how are you doing? I'm fine. Yeah, good. How, how did you manage to? Have you, what, can you tell us what you make of the report anyway? I'll, 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 I'll just get to the question. <laughs> well, I, thought of the, I, I, I basically agree with what's been said. I mean, in many ways, it's a deeply flawed report because of this thing it tries to do, which says there's, you know, it's like a really bad divorce uh, decision where they go, well, you know, there's fault on both sides, you know, one of those ones. But actually, if you dig into it, the truth does come out. And that is shocking, of course. But we don't, we're not just here to be shocked. What we're doing is laying down this stuff for the future. That's what this is about. But we also need to be asking questions of those people who are supposed to be our leaders on this. And I, I you know, I, I would ask them. Sorry, John McDonald, it's not good enough saying I really think something needs to be done about this, you know, or, 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 or even Jeremy sort of saying, well, you know, this was hard, but we now must look to the future. I think it's time we had a truth and reconciliation sort of committee on this, an open public truth and, and, and reconciliation committee. But because, for example, somebody pointed this out on Twitter. Ford had more contact with JVL than Owen Jones has ever done. Now, when you've got that happening in the left, forget the right, they were going to attack us. They're our enemies, for goodness sake. We don't look to them for help. They're our enemies. But what we need to do is build solidarity. That's what we need. Sorry. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll bring, I'm going to bring Chris back on. Um, uh, Chris, have you have you read the report? Uh, well, I've skimmed it. I've not read it in detail. And I agree with a lot of the comments uh, that have been made. It's a bit like a curious egg, as far as I can see. I mean, it's good, good in parts, but I think, as others have already pointed out, this attempt to sort of demonstrate some sort of equivalence. I think Simon was absolutely spot on in his observations, that there is no equivalence here. And I think, frankly, just in response to uh, Leah's uh, comments about, you know, Jeremy Lotto took the issue very seriously. Yes, they did take it uh, seriously. In my opinion, they took it too seriously. And that comes back to the point I was making, Crispy. They were giving it legs. They were facilitating it. Setting up, I mean, asking Janet Royal to go and do this inquiry into the Oxford University uh, uh, Labour Club, uh, that was the first mistake. There was no, I mean, she even, she, even she, a Zionist, even she had to conclude that there was no evidence, really, of any kind of uh, institutional widespread anti-Semitism in the OULC. And similarly, with the Chakrabarti, the only people kind of cite the Chakrabarti, that was some, some great sort of uh, thing. But again, it was a mistake, I think. That, that what It all goes back right from the very get-go. Facilitating this Zionist lobby in the way in which they did was disastrous. They they operate a maximalist strategy, and I mean, Jackie's uh, confirmed this. And of course, the right wing just use that as a convenient stick to beat Jeremy and to destroy the Corbyn project. And we are where we are now, utterly utter defeat to the left inside the Labour Party. It was catastrophic. And so this report, um, I think, has illustrated that yes, it said it's confirmed, as was it that anti-Semitism was weaponized. Very interesting that because people like me were, were suspended uh, on yeah. the course to be, uh, you know, expelled, of course. And even, even when I won the High Court case, they then introduced yet another suspension to stop me being um, readmitted to the party. And I hear it on good authority 
that people inside the disciplinary units of the of the party saw JVL as anti-Semitic. I mean, that's that's where we were at. And I and I know from some of the people that I spoke to in the leader's office, they kept JVL, as did the Socialist Campaign Group, they kept JVL, who were our comrades, kept JVL at arm's length, whilst continuing to facilitate uh, and prostrate themselves before the JLM, who were our sworn enemies. I mean, talk about a, you know, a, a, a ludicrous self-debating strategy. I mean, you know, if you'd wanted a more self-debating strategy than the one that was deployed, you'd be hard pressed to find one. I mean, we just killed ourselves. That's, that's the stop bottom it. And as, as you know, Crispin, I was the only MP, the only MP that was prepared to call this out. And even I was fairly mealy mouthed in the way in which I did it. Actually, I think even I should have been a lot more robust. But that tells you a story of how pathetic the left was inside the, uh, you know, the upper echelons of the party. They let us down. They betrayed us, actually. They betrayed this movement. They betrayed the country, in my opinion. Because that's what gave us Boris Johnson. That's what given us this kind of turbocharged neoliberalism, hurtling us potentially towards World War III. We I mean, talk about a disaster. God almighty. Right. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to bring on um, Steve uh, Steve from Scorebox as well. Uh, Steve, are you still, still there? Um... I'm still here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I know you've got to go, but I just thought, is there, is there anything you'd like to add to what's been said um, about the report that, that we haven't mentioned or, or something that you'd like to bring up? Um, well, I think one of the key things to um, to observe in it really is that it's, you know, presumably because Keir Starman narrowed the um, parameters of the, of the report from uh, Ford, because we know that he... He meddled with the terms of reference of the report on a number of occasions, I understand it, throughout the, the two-year delay. Um, is that, you know, it, it, it's very narrow, so it really only looks at the specific stuff to do with protected characteristics and, and doesn't take into account any of the other kind of wider um, abuse uh, or even all of the abuse of protected characteristics, really, within the... Uh, you know, that was going on in the Labour right as revealed by the WhatsApp and, and the email messages. Um, so, you know, that's the other thing that needs to be drawn out and it'll take a bit of time to do is what what's, what did the report ignore, uh, presumably on the orders of Keir Starmer, um, who commissioned the thing and then tweaked it. Um, but can I just so, check that you, you think they've definitely, it's been edited or, or, or best with in some ways I, before I it came out? I can't that conclusion. I, what, you know, what else was the two-year delay for? Because there's nothing really in the in the report that required that. You know, it's not treading on people's toes with regard to uh, legal cases apart from Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and, you know, they basically said, you know, ignored all that and said, well, you wouldn't talk to them anyway. So, um you know, it, it reads to me like there's been various amendments or insertions going on from whatever the original report must have been that to me look maybe haggled over, but then, you know, designed by the Labour right to give them enough sound bites to try and present it as if it's a, you know, an, a vindication of them and a condemnation of the left. Now, you know, if... if I mean, uh, I... If, I, if, I, if, I, if, I want to tell me that's not the case, I'm happy to chat about it with you, but that's, that's definitely what it looks like to be when I read it. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot more to come out from from the report. This is this is almost you know, this is just a day after it was um, released. I don't know how it was released. Then everyone suddenly thought, "Well, I've got a copy. How did you, where did you get your copy from?" It's uh, the whole thing was about a leak. It was meant to be about a leaked report. That how did it get leaked? And it, the bloody report got leaked. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a bit of a joke, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm, I know the time's running out because I want to. I want to bring in. Uh, I want to talk about Sri Lanka um, with Namala, so who's come back on. Uh, so I'm going to. What I'm. What I'm proposing. Lots of people put their hands up here to speak. I'd like to bring uh, this discussion back on on Sunday, um, so that we can have a, a big a bigger discussion on, on that. Okay, um, and and Ben as well. I'll get, uh, thank you, Steve, for coming on and. And thank you, thank you, Chris. I'm just, I'm just aware of the time. Um, I'll just get Ben on. Uh, ben, are you, are I you am there? Yeah. Uh, I can't see. I've got to do your video thing. Uh, <laughs> there you go, Ben. Um, 
can we can we carry on this on on Sunday because you'll have more stuff then as well, won't you? Yeah, absolutely. I've I've got one bit I could share quickly now if if you if that's useful to you. Uh, I think I think we should um, I think we should wait till I think we should try and wait till Sunday. No problem. Um, and have as many people come on and speak as well. I want I'll do a survey, um, so people can uh, write down what they can can answer how they feel about the, the report. Fantastic. Um, and I think we have to sort of keep it going. I don't, I don't really want to to limit this to, to just today. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for, to all the people who've put their hands up, um, and, and we will get we will get on to uh, yeah. It, oh, give us a taster, Quispin says Cal. Have you got a taster then? Um, ben, just a quick taster. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you something really, really quickly. Um, this is a, a juicy one that uh, I spotted, I tweeted uh, earlier today. Uh, just to check, you can all see this. Quick hands up. Yeah, you can all see this, can you? Yeah, yeah. Lovely. So uh, in that £135,000 budget, which, act which actually ballooned, that I mentioned earlier, £45,000 of it has gone missing. Nobody can find it. And in the um, the Ford report, they said it is beyond our purview to go and find this. So who's finding it? Where has that 45 grand gone? Is, is it dissipated down the back of the sofa? Has it been spent at McDonald's on milkshakes? Where's it gone? Anyway, so that sort of thing is what you're going to be seeing more of in the future. OK, all right. Well, that, we'll, we'll look forward to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Keep doing what you're doing. It's great. A pleasure. <laughs>